Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 41. We've renamed the podcast, and it's now the Focus on Gaming podcast. So uh, welcome, and welcome to Gary Bracey, legend of Ocean Software and many other projects, which we'll get into. But uh, welcome, Gary. Nice Thank to have you, you on. very much. Delighted to be here, Tom. Thanks for asking me. And welcome, Duncan, of course. Hello, I'm here as well, yes. <laughs> <But secondary. laughs> Unfortunately, Martin's not with us today because he's stuck in traffic. So, um, but uh, he'll be back next week. So, so as I said, welcome, Gary, to uh, the podcast. Um, we've got a number of questions for you, but it'd be interesting to have your take on you uh, as a gaming industry legend. So, can you tell us just a brief overview of your history in gaming? Um, I hate using that term, but it always makes me <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, uh, well, I, I started at the in the heyday of, of, of computer games, I guess. Um, I had my own little retail shop in Liverpool. Um, I knew John Woods and David Ward actually uh, personally, who recently started a game called a uh, company called Spectrum Games, which became Ocean. Um, they were great marketeers and businessmen, but they didn't know an awful lot about computer games. They wanted someone in did and because i sold them i was then an expert <laughs> so um i uh, i came on board as software manager they asked me to look after the development um most of the development was being undertaken those days by freelance bedroom programmers all over the country in brighton and goodness mm -hmm. knows where they did have a small in-house team and the quality stuff was coming from the in-house team the likes of david collier and and joffa Brian Buchan, etc. Um, but all the stuff that was being done freelance was dross. It was terrible uh, if it was being done at all. So um, I took the view of, of maybe the way to go is to expand the uh, the in-house team. And we did that. And, and in fairness to David and John, they showed a leap of faith and let me indulge with that. So I went on a big recruitment drive and sourced amazing talent the likes. Mm. I hate mentioning names because if I mention names, then I inevitably means I leave some out, and I, yeah. I don't like doing that. But in those days, you know, the likes of of Simon Butler and, and and Mike Lamb and Dawn Drake and John Megan and and uh, there were there were so many John Bramwood, um, and we built up this amazing team of talent um, who I mm. considered to be the best in the world at creation at design at development programming the musicians the likes of martin galway who was already there but john dunn who came shortly afterwards and barry leach i mean these were incredible talents um the artists uh, you know we, we were just blessed with with great talent and um, they really did transform the industry in a lot of ways i, th I think we were the first big studio um, I mean, this mm. is before the days of EA and, and, and things like that. And, and there was no set technique for how things were done, how you develop games, because traditionally games were being developed in bedrooms by one programmer and one artist. And it was very, very rare to have a studio. Yeah. And we were the first major, I believe, major publisher studio uh, in the world. Um, mm. And... It, it sort of took off from there, and I think that goes towards the quality of the talent that we had um, goes towards the success that the company enjoyed, I believe. I think yeah. uh, e E.T., I think, famously, the really person was, was told, yeah. was told um, no, it was one person they were told five weeks. They had to get E.T. out for the Atari yes. and whatnot. So, we we uh, had a couple of similar situations, but no. <laughs> Not as extreme, <laughs> but um, yeah, we had a couple of uh, of clunkers like that. I mean, you know, you're not going to have a spotless record, but uh, as long as you have a reasonable hit rate, then you keep the faith, I guess. So, I think one of my uh, guilty pleasures for uh, Ocean Software was Terminator 2. And I know it doesn't have always the best rep for a game, but I kind of enjoy it a lot, especially the yeah. Amstrad version. Yeah, <laughs> yeah proud uh, of that one. Sorry, Duncan, carry on. So, um, we, were you a gamer before? What was the first game that you ever remember playing? Probably, I know it's a tired old trope, um, Manic Miner. I mean, 
the, the thing was that we I was in Liverpool. I'm in Liverpool now, actually, visiting family. But I'm from Liverpool. And we had a great industry in Liverpool with the likes of Bug Bite and Imagine. And um, I knew the guys there. I mean, I was in... I was in clothing at the time, men, menswear, and I remember going to Bug Bite and Imagine with my samples of shirts and etc., and trading them for, for computer games for Miss Spectrum. Um, and I got friendly with the, the Matthew Smiths of this world and everyone else. And uh, I remember when Jet Set Willy was launched, um, and this is before I got in proper into the industry myself, I was helping software projects out packing cassette boxes into packs to be shipped out to the various games companies yeah. and uh, game shops. Um, and, and Matthew Smith himself was there putting cassettes in boxes. We were all there, uh, all hands on deck. Um, it's almost like the, the gamer version of hanging like hanging around with Andy Warhol kind of thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, th those, were, those were heady days. And it was, it was the very, very beginning of... Of the industry as, as we now know it and things have changed dramatically but i truly believe that the 80s and early 90s were just magical years to be involved in that industry it was the birth of the industry i call it the rock and roll years and uh, it was it was truly amazing yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and what was it like working with the different uh methods of getting the license and then taking it to, from the programmers to the distribution. Oh. I mean, what was that era like? It was, it was wonderful. I mean, I was really, I mean, my big thing was movies. I loved movies. Um, so yeah. I used to read all the scripts. I, I, I just gorged myself on, on every script that came through. And by and large, because they weren't the completed movies, they were just from script. We had to make, decisions on whether the script the actors and the directors were good enough to potentially make a good genre movie that we could make a game from and then what we do yeah. is we take sections of the script of the story and say okay we can adapt that into an interactive version of the game hence in untouchables you have the pram going down the stairs and you've got to protect the pram the baby carriage um and and all those and that, that's why we came up with um and again i think we were quite innovative in this way we came up with multi-section games for the movies like platoon i think was probably the first one where it wasn't just a yeah. platform game or a shoot 'em up the game was divided into different types of of sections robocop was another and um i think we got known yeah. for that and it was it was great fun um probably the most successful of all was batman commercially um uh, batman the movie yeah. so w w i think we we got that part, part right and uh, no one else really did that I don't did you ever mm. find yourself um like with any sort of celebrities that where you were like oh my god you know did you actually meet them or did they just was it all remote my um my, my career is is a massive wonderland of that and i met <laughs> everyone i had meetings with a meeting with steve jobs um i had a creative meeting on jurassic park with steven spielberg i was on the set of hook with robin williams and dustin hoffman and we were drinking we were chatting i mean i i was very very fortunate i i remember funnily enough when um I've been thinking about my celebrity meets and, and truly I met many, 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 many celebrities. Um, but one that stuck out in my mind one day, I went to this agent's office and he'd arranged two meetings. And the first one was with uh, a chap called James Clavell, who at the time was a massive author and he wrote books, uh, Shogun and um, something else, but they were all about samurai warriors and whatnot. And he was a really smart guy. And he, he said something to me, which has always remained with me. He said, uh, he introduced himself, and I introduced myself, Gary Bracey, nice to meet you. He said, Bracey, that's an interesting name. He said, I'm, I'll make a note of that. I must use that in one of my books as my, for one of my characters. And you go, wow, this is great. So, of course, when his next books came out, I bought them. Then I realized he must say that to absolutely everyone. <laughs> 
and everyone were buying <laughs> books from then on. I thought that was genius. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think Abrasi yeah. has ever appeared in any of his books. Um, but the second one that day was um, a band who'd just got famous. They bought a boat and they were going to uh, enter a, in a boat race. And it was Duran Duran. And they loved video games. Ah. So we had a meeting with them to notionally create a game based on their boat, which was called Drum. Um, and had a whole afternoon yeah. meeting with them. And then Yasmin walked in and I was blown away. Because she <laughs> had something else. Stunning, yeah. stunning. So, yes. It was amazing. And, and, and those things. And I've only remembered those meetings recently. I've never spoken about them before. Um, but I had... Yeah. I mean, it, it really was. It was. It, I say it was the rock and roll days. I was very lucky because I was spending two weeks out of six in Hollywood because I was on the film sets and yeah. you know yeah. uh, sitting with Tim Burton going through the daily rushes, <laughs> Batman. Um, I, I, you asked me the question. I'm not deliberately name dropping, but no, um, no, no. <laughs> it's a question it's I could spend all day answering. Did you, did you ever just sit there and go? What am I doing here? It's no, I, I, I was, I actually appreciated every second. And yeah. when it all finished, and when I went on to a proper job, and um, <laughs> um, people used to say to me, Oh, don't you miss that? And I say, Absolutely not. I'm just so grateful that I got the chance to do it in the first place. Um, and, and there were, yeah. there were other things, unrelated things. I remember being at this bar in, uh, I think it was on, on Sunset Hollywood Boulevard, and Richard Pryor walked, and Richard Pryor was one of my biggest influences. I, he was a god to me, uh, but it was the time he was wasting away, and he was he had MS, and he was very, very frail, and we, he just plonked himself next to me by by coincidence, and we struck up a chat, and and he was he was amazing, and that was that was a pinch me moment actually, and you know um, they say never meet your heroes, but that was one I was. I was happy to meet. Um, and yeah, it, it was just extraordinary. Just... Yeah. Wow, wow. Wow. That's. Yeah. Yeah. So was there ever a license or a game that got away that you really wanted and either you got the license and it was made and not released or just simply got away? Yeah, I, I think um, it got very competitive. Once movie licenses for games had established themselves and they became money spinners. Um, then obviously there was a fight, and, and I, I recall Acclaim was a big competitor of ours. Um, and what, what was interesting is Acclaim got The Simpsons, and I remember yeah. um, everyone being quite upset that we didn't nab it. It was quite expensive. But I also recall, could, because I spent so much time out in the States at the time, I remember bringing this show and presenting it to the directors of the company, the fellow directors, and saying, this is a cartoon, I know, but it's getting a lot of support, a lot of traction, and it's going to be big, and it's worth worth getting. And no one was interested, and that was The Simpsons. And then two years later, the license was picked up for a ridiculous amount of money. Um, and, uh, mm. yeah, that was so, sort of got away, but not from me. It got away from everyone else. I think I, we, we interviewed uh, Bill Harbison a couple of months ago, and I can't remember who he said that did it, but um, he said that somebody didn't have something to do one afternoon, so knocked up a prototype for a Simpsons a game, a Simpsons yeah. isometric game, and that was the kind of thing they did. Yes, <laughs> was, yeah. I'm bored, um, I'll write a game. No, exactly. we, we did. I mean, Bill, Bill was an exceptional talent, uh, along with, with the others I was talking about, and, and you know, they would come up because the artists were also the design. We didn't have back then. I mean, later on we did, but back then we didn't have games designers. Mostly it was the artists and, and the collaboration with the programmers who came up with the design of the games. It, it was, it was sort of like a very much a collaborative effort. Whereas these days you've got designers yeah. and that's exactly what they do, but we were making it up as we went along. Yeah. There was no rule book. I think there was personality in the games back then as well, whereas now it's uh, they're almost quite generic. They lose that. It's, it's, it's funny it's like you personal. say that. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny you say that because I bemoan the fact that there's very little innovation in terms of design 
in terms of games content mm. and and you know we got some new fresh stuff when mobile phones came out but that was by virtue of the interface being swipe touch um which had to replace yeah. obviously the joystick so the game mechanics had to adapt to suit those interfaces and that's fine but as far as i'm concerned with a few exceptions the the, the la last truly innovative game was Tomb Raider, which was the first really immersive 3D game. I mean, you had Doom and stuff, yeah. but Tomb Raider on the PlayStation really broke boundaries there and gave you a proper 3D perspective, excuse the pun. Um, and since then, there's been, um, oh, Jesus, Portal, amazing oh. original game. Yeah. Um, but they've been yeah. really few and far between. There's been some great games, and I love the particularly love the Bethesda stuff, the Skyrim fallouts and all those. But they are, if I may say, derivative. They're the best in their genre, but they're still conceptually as games. Game there is very little true innovation, and, and that's something I find really sad. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see a change in that as as now we're going back to the, the handheld gaming. Um, hopefully we'll get a lot of more independence coming on board to, to so. reinvent. That would be good. So, so. Yeah. Duncan. Oh, next question, Tom. <laughs> oh, go on. Do it if you wish. <laughs> yes, you, you go How ahead. did the Hit Squad releases come about? Um, personally, I collect Hit Squad, um, and I've got about 25 titles, but um, it's definitely hard to, harder to come by some of the releases now on the hit squad and the prices are going yeah. up and up but how did that come about from the original release to bringing things over was there any licensing issues or no there the were the ones I, I think it was the second bite of a cherry i mean um I, I think the core of the hit squad initiative was david ward um and he saw you know the likes of telecom soft and mastertronics making a lot of money from these budget games and um we weren't in the market of making, writing, publishing budget games, but what we did have was this growing back catalog, which had lived their lives, and well, why not, you know, re-release them under a budget label? And the Hit Squad was born, and uh, and then we had the compilations. They sold a million and, and all that. Um, but yeah, it was um, it was it was it was just a business issue, and and it worked very very well. Yeah. So, and in fact, some of those now, I mean, are reaching two hundred pound for no. a, one cassette. Seriously? Yeah. yeah. Some of the, yeah, some of the hit squad games are crazy pricing. That's mad. more so than the original releases. There was no one in Ocean as, at the time who kept copies of every. You, there was no mu Ocean Museum or storage. No one thought about keeping copies of the games and we had no showcase with all the games and there was nothing like that i think mark jones um took it upon himself uh, a few years back to start amassing that collection and it's a lot of games when you consider because it's not just we were quite prolific in terms of what we produced title wise but you've also got to remember each title was published over many formats and some disc and mm -hmm. cassette so, you know, it wasn't uncommon to have one title and eight or nine releases from that one title. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, was, uh, what do you consider the best or the greatest platform that you released on? Um, well, I mean, obviously I've been involved right up to recently. Um, so I loved all the consoles and everything, but I, I think... In terms of fun and challenge, I, I love the 16-bit stuff, the Amiga days, um, because they allowed us to jump from a really pixelated um, spectrum 8-bit display um, to something that was approaching what we thought at the time was a realistic uh, look. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm very, very proud of Batman the movie I mentioned before as one mm. uh, game that really, really did justice to the format. So um, it, it's difficult to say which format. I mean, obviously, I have a love of the Spectrum because that's the one I first cut my teeth on. Um, <laughs> uh, 
affection for Commodore 64, not so much for the format, but um, the likes of Sensible Software um, uh, pretty much exclusively developed their games on the 64, which gave me an affinity to that format, which I didn't really have before. Um, and and then the 16 bits came along and DID came along and, and they did all those flight sims and everything else. And they were extraordinary. So um, I think it's, it's, it's all about the era. You know, I would, I would look back in terms of the eras and what were the popular platforms. And then of course, when the consoles came along, that was a game changer, excuse the pun. Um, and, and we obviously got involved with the Nintendo and consoles seemed to be the future and the way it was going, although PC obviously never really disappeared. Um, yeah. And, you know, PlayStation was, was extraordinary. It was 3D, which we'd never really had properly before. And, and, and the derivatives and the sequels from that. Um, and, and then, you know, the internet just changed everything in terms of multiplayer. So, you know, you can categorize. And then the handhelds, of course, going from Game Boy right up to mobile phones these days and everything in between. It, it, it's just become an extraordinary collection of, of, of eras I, I, rather than genres. Um, it's, it's what was right in the era. And it's difficult it's Sophie's choice. You're asking me to choose my favourite child. <laughs> you can't choose your favourite child, isn't it? <laughs> I, just, I, I mean, I find that the eight bit that what amazes me is not necessarily the games because you know I was very much a small child in the eighties, um, playing the you know what games my parents would allow me to buy. <laughs> um, but uh, it's just now I look back on them and the technical ability to get something that, in terms of data, is less than a picture that my phone takes now. Yeah. Um, yeah. if that's a lot less than a picture that my phone takes. And yes. the fact that you say about the different genres in each game, the technical ability and to get all the art in with so little colours, and it, it's, it was amazing. And Ocean were the ones. They, they, they were the ones that had the impressive games, the, the, the big name, the big... We, we tried. Was, we tried. Was, As I say, we, we didn't have a hundred percent record, but um, we, we were up there, and, and there, there was a lot we were very, very proud of, and I, I think justifiable. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, fully agree. So, what are your thoughts on gaming today? I know you've mentioned about the, the types of games, and we spoke about that, but things like they're talking about metaverse and VR, and obviously you've got Steam decks and things like that. What are your thoughts on where things are now, system-wise? I, I, I think it's time for a sea change. I mean, I was latterly, before I retired, which was a couple of years ago, um, I was involved in the whole metaverse type thing and, and, and brainstorming with a company called Terra Virtua, which I co-founded. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we were coming up with concepts and ideas that I think have legs and, 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 and you know, you will be in a, an environment... In, it's Ready Player One, basically. Um, and maybe not quite as immersive, not for quite a while, as Ready Player One, but in terms of having various games at your fingertips and, and then merging with each other and, and you are able to drive a racing car from one game into another game and, and, and sort of get out the car and then pick up your gun and you're in Call of Duty or Fallout or whatever. I, I think there's an awful lot to be said. The problem and the limitation is not in the technology at all. all the technology can serve all of this. It's for the games companies to be able to play nicely with each other. And they exactly. won't do that at the moment. Um, and there was there was... One of the things I was trying to do at the time was saying, okay, well, if you could get um, buy a gun in Call of Duty and use it in um, Fallout, I keep using the, 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 those, the same <laughs> names, but using those guns in Fallout and vice versa. And talking to Activision, they said, well, you know, why should we allow people to buy guns in Fallout and use them in Call of Duty? How do we earn money from that? And, well, apart from the obvious, it opens it up and you bring more people into your game. Uh, my solution off the top of my head was you sell ammunition. 
So you don't have to sell the gun, but you can sell the ammunition. So they can only use that gun if they buy the ammunition in your game. So there are yeah. creative ways of addressing these problems. But at the moment, they, they like the fact that their games are ring-fenced. And um, uh, it's the Apple mentality, which I'm not going to yeah. so, You know, no. I, I don't like that. And only once those barriers are lowered. And I think we might be getting a hint of that now with... The talk of Microsoft allowing some of the games to be published on PlayStation platforms, some of their exclusives. Yeah. So that could be the start or the hint of something like that happening. I hope so. Yeah, it would be good, definitely. Yeah, I, I think, think I think we've we've got things like um, like Epic are trying uh, their own sort of bringing in various games into one where you've got their their racing lego fortnite fortnite yes. and all that um but again they're 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 arguing with apple and then apple are arguing with google and uh it's all very much yeah they, they don't they want to get on but it's all about who makes the money yes and they all it's interesting now that disney have invested in fortnite and disney are invested in apple Yes. So I think you're right. I think we'll see those doors opening and that universe expanding into other the areas. And, and they've got yeah. to embrace the indies as well because it's the indies who will bring the innovation. The big companies yeah. play it safe. Um, the indies don't, and they're the innovative ones. So hopefully yeah. we'll see a big change over the coming years. And then you've got the, these things potentially on the sideline like VR and AR, which can also contribute and, again, create groundbreaking new dynamics and mechanics in games and if you yeah. put all of this together the future for gaming could be extraordinary but it means that there needs to be a lot more collaboration than there is at the moment i agree one question i'd like to ask you is uh as a two-part question and i just thought of it while we were talking will there ever be a gary bracy book about the ocean software days and secondly, will we ever see an Ocean Software compilation release linked to some of the old games on the Evercade or Steam Store or something like that? Um, to answer your first question, I, I think porn is totally accessible now anyway, so why would it be? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, I, 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 there will never be a copy. Thank you for asking, but um, I, I would... I toyed with the idea of, of writing the book, but there's stuff that I couldn't include um, and it could be libelous and whatever. And, and so, so um, uh, no, I, I, unfortunately, we're just going to have to depend on lovely interviews like this where uh, I can sort of reach into the recesses of my memory and bring out a nugget or two. But um, uh, it, it's... Uh, no, sadly not. But I've contributed to some books. There was a sensible software book. There was an ocean book, of course. Um, yeah. And I, I've contributed when asked. I'll, I'll, I'll happily do it. But as the years go on, uh, it get, does get more and more difficult to remember. And I, I mentioned the Duran Duran and James Clavell thing to you. And that just popped into my head about a week ago. And I don't recall ever talking about that to anyone before. And I've still got a book. The drum, the drum was the name of the boat, the, boat, the Duran Duran boat. And I've still got a book that they signed for me. And um, um, it was it was, it was was quite amazing. So, um, no, there won't be. Uh, the second question, um, I think that's going to be very difficult. I did endeavour at a certain time to see if I could get back um, the Ocean Back catalogue with that very thing in mind of, 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 of adapting a lot of the games and perhaps releasing them on, on mobile or whatever. Um, mm. And I don't think it can, it will ever happen. Nice, licensing? The people, um, well, the people who own... No, the people who own the Ocean brand and IP don't know what they have. And so... Right. Um, it, it, it's difficult, I think, logistically, and it's probably not worth their while. When I got into a conversation with a lawyer, um, and I think it was the time Atari had uh, the Ocean IP, um, 
that basically it wasn't worth their while to investigate what they had, whether they had to, because of course they'd have to, if we're talking about the movie licenses, they'd have to renew the licenses as well, which would there yeah. would be a cost and it just wasn't viable for them to do it yeah so, and it's so much there that could be so huge. much but not a huge amount of original stuff i mean you had the likes of the sensible the did the john ripman stuff um again i don't want to miss anyone up but there was, there was we had a lot of original games that i was proud of but um i i I don't know that. I'll tell you what was a great one that I always thought would be wonderfully on uh, console was the Ant game. I've forgotten what it was called. Pushover. On, yes, was I was playing. I was playing that on. It's on Steam. Is it really? It is on Steam, and I played that yeah. about a month ago. It's a great um, it's game. Sponsored by Quavers. That's right. Yes, we did a deal. Um, there was a chap called Daniel Bobroff, and we were bringing adverts into games. It was a again that was groundbreaking in itself. So we brought um, brands and IP into games, and they sponsored them. And basically, Quavers would pretty much cover the cost of development, and everything else was bunt. It was oh, wow. no, it was it's a fantastic puzzle game. Um, it is very clever. Very I could still find there were still level codes available on the internet. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was. Brilliant! I loved it, um, and it had full motion cartoon. Kind of yes. Thing. Well, it Simon is. Butler designed the ant on that, and uh, G I Ant Giant, um, and it was, <laughs> it was really good. It was clever. It was a really good game. Right. Yeah. I think in last question, Tom. Yeah. So, how would I'm going to change the way we, we were asking this question? How would you like your era in gaming, your your Legacy. impact on the industry? to be remembered in, by future generations? If it is remembered, I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's very difficult to answer that because it would come out as arrogant if I wish fulfillment and all that. Um, Feel free. I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think we'd like to be known, and I say we, everyone who was involved with Ocean in those days, as if I could be so bold as to say pioneering, I, I'd like to think we we did set the bar in certain ways um, for the way games are produced, the way games are acquired, the way IP is acquired and designed. And, and a lot of what we did, we set a template for which is still being used today. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, back then you'd have two or three people writing a game. Now it's two or three thousand, <laughs> so a slight difference. But um, um, I, I don't know. I, I think the greatest thrill for me is that people still look back fondly on those games. They see it as a, an intrinsic part of their childhood. And knowing that I was a, a small part of that is, is enough. It really is. Um, and people look back with affection and nostalgia. And to, to, to have contributed to some of that is, is enough, really. Yeah, that's what I think. My, my kids literally, about a month ago, completed uh, Robocop. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old, and they sat there together doing the levels mm -hmm. and completed it. I never completed it when I was a kid. Well, that's, that's amazing good. because going back to those games, they are so much more difficult than you remember. They oh, yes. are not easy. And, I mean, going back from Manic Miner right up, right through, very, very difficult to complete a lot of those games. So I if your kids completed Robocop, good on them. I saw that screen, first screen on Manic Miner thousands of times. So, yes. so. Yeah, and you always uh, you get it pixel perfect, the jump. Oh, yes. um, no, it was, it was wonderful. And I... I Unfortunately, I have to go, but yep. I'll leave you one, one thing. There is another celebrity I met, and this is a lovely segue for you, which was Mr. Sugar. And wow. we had a meeting, um, and if you've got kids listening, you may need one to switch this off. <laughs> or mute it. Um, but we had a meeting uh, in which he was introducing, um, he was doing a, ca a cartridge version because the Nintendo was sneaking up there and cartridge was becoming the thing of the future. And he was, he'd created this cartridge version of the, the CPC and wanted us to support it. So we went over there and he presented it and he was, he was just like he is with the apprentice. You can do this. You can. 
And it was, effing. and we were all there in suits and trying to be very proper. And he was, ah, you do this, <laughs> you do that, and you make your fucking games on these. I, <laughs> you can cut this bit out if you need. Um, but that was, that was our. That's right, uh, we our, can tick the explicit box. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you, that was that was back then, and everyone was was quite prim and proper in those days. And uh, here we had, you know, a, a leader of industry um, just just giving it to us straight. And we came away. And I remember, you know, it wasn't just me and, and some of the other directors. We had a lot of our creative guys in this meeting as well because they wanted to see what the potential was. And they all came away saying. I don't want to do anything for that guy. <laughs> you know, we're not inspired by it at all. Um, yeah. Or threatened. Um, <laughs> Especially so, with the machine as well. I mean, the GX4000 was dreadful. GX4000, so. that was it, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we didn't, I think we may have done, you know, one or two because we'd done well with Amstrad before and we had a lot yeah. of affection for the machine and some of our best um, games versions of games renegade perhaps being one of them was um the best version was on the amstrad um yeah, so, it was yeah um, but we, so, we yeah we could talk to you for hours um i think you have, have, to go. Sorry, you part have got to go <laughs> yeah. I, it has been i can speak personally i think tom will say the same thing it has been an absolute privilege and interesting beyond belief to talk to you thank yeah. you ever so much you, well thanks for part of my you. childhood and uh, and uh you were the one interview that i said i wanted on here so thank you for joining us I really oh, well, thank you so much for i always find it flattering and i i really am humbled that you asked me so it's been an absolute yeah. pleasure thank you for allowing me to unburden some of my dim and distant memories <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah best of luck with the podcast and then rebranding yes that's it thank you very much yeah. Thank Thanks you. so So thank you to Gary Bracey for that fantastic interview. And uh, Gary touched upon the uh, the Amstrad, which uh, is the 40th anniversary of the Amstrad 464, the CPC 464, which was released in 1983. Um, believe it or not, a long time ago. Um, when it was released, it came with uh, the Amstrad. Just game. correct you, it is 1984, is it? Because it's 2024. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, you are but, uh, it came with some AMSOFT software, so it had uh, pre populated software within the uh, the box. With the and you had a choice between the green screen monitor or the color monitor, and uh, you had the colorful keyboard, um, with the cassette deck that was part of the structure of the machine. Um, a lot of the games with the with green screen, particularly Simpsons, as Gary mentioned you couldn't see the homework sheets that were flying around in the street on the first level. So if you had a green screen monitor, <laughs> you weren't completing the game or getting past the first level. So, uh, oh, dear. Yeah, I know. Oh, dear. But we moved well, on to I'm, the... I'm guessing if you wanted to game, you pretty much had to buy the colour one anyway, really. Really. I remember trying to game on a on a on like an old, uh, an old PC with yeah. piece, uh, five and a quarter inch discs. And on a green screen, once, and it was not a nice experience. Well, it was the cut price model of the CPC, that's why. So if you didn't have a lot of money, uh, that you got the green screen. So, um, but there was the modulator which allowed you to connect it to a TV as well. So you could buy this add-on, oh. um, and and there were like the printers and, and and various other things, and the floppy disk or not the floppy disk. It was the old magnet uh, style disk system that we could plug into the back um which was easy to erase you just had to leave it near something electronic for too long and, and <laughs> it, was done. it was over so but um obviously Alan good Schuchel, quality amstrad products as usual yeah yeah <laughs> but that was a general thing with the the technology of the day wasn't it if you well, had magnets had near special. anything or or any yeah, kind yeah. of um, electrical signals go near anything else it would that was it. It was gone, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, Amstrad would release their Christmas special, their Christmas product for the year, and everyone would wait to see what this cut price new thing would be. So it went from hi fi's to um, uh, the uh, what was it the Amstrad emailer and all things like that. And and the Amstrad CPC was meant to be the Christmas special, but obviously with that they they didn't think about you need software 
and that's how Ramsoft came about with uh, uh, like Roland on the Ropes and Oh Mummy and Harrier Attack and things like that from Jarrell Software. And you know, there was so many games, and um, some of the games were absolutely fantastic, but then some were absolutely dreadful, like Animal, Vegetable, Mineral. Don't ask. <laughs> so, yeah. What did you just go? Tree. Uh, animal. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Oh yeah. God. It was a word association game, I guess you'd call it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's Not a fantastic. Nice, yeah. I've, I've got to say, I, 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 I think we chatted a little bit before. I, I don't know much about the Amstrad, and I'll tell you what, what, how I saw. And probably still see Amstrad a bit. I see the spectrum as the people who couldn't quite afford the Commodore 64. Yeah. And the people who had the Commodore 64 uh, if, if, wouldn't have wanted an Amstrad. Yeah. And I, I just think it was this it was the it was the middle of the road. It was device. the poor cousin at the time. It was the poor cousin so... of the C64, and it was the expensive version of the Spectrum. Yeah. And so and that's why it. it was third place, wasn't it? Really, it was. Apart from in Spain and France, where it was it, the leader of the pack. But um, the, uh, in fact, I think it was France or was it Spain that had a slightly different model, because there was some legality around the type of memory uh, uh, that was allowed in the machine. They want, and without going into too much detail, they managed to get away with adding this extra bit of memory in and releasing it out there um, oh. um <laughs> but yeah <laughs> to give you an idea the introductory price of the green screen monitor and system was 199 so this is back okay in so it wasn't i think the spectrum was uh in the hundreds hundreds yeah something, wasn't it yeah and then so, the color screen was 299 so and it's sold oh, two million see now yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't a terrible machine, and it had some positives. I'm not saying it was a dreadful machine. Um, I just I just remember it back in the eighties. Um, you had all the kids who were C64 owners, were like, "Yeah, we've got money," kind of thing. And then you had all the Spectrum ones going, "Yeah, but everybody makes games for us. We've got yeah. more games." Um, yeah. And then you had the CPC owners that were like. Uh, I've got to have some more. <laughs> yeah, they were sort of yeah. trying to hang around with both all of us going, Yeah, I've got a computer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it's funny because the, the CPC was designed to be very similar to the BBC Micro, where it was you had all the manuals. In fact, it had some of the most detailed manuals, particularly when it went up to the six one two eight. So you could learn to program and a lot of parents would not only was it cost effective, but you they would buy it because it had all this stuff where the kids could learn to program and, and make their own games. Of course, most kids weren't doing their homework and making their own games. They were playing games that their parents bought, such as Robocop and Platoon and Although, all that. Uh, look, just looking for the photos, because I, I only remembered what the one with the colours buttons, which was the 464, yes? Yeah. yeah. And then they made the 612, 6128, is it? Yep, yeah, 6128. Yeah. And it's grey. Yep. So it's so, like, yay, we got one and it looks really colourful and nice and everything. I'm, I'm presuming that they were going for a more professional look or something like that. But yeah. it's like, oh, can I get this weaker one or this more powerful one? And the more yeah. powerful one looks boring. Um, I think it was a, a case of they need to target a more professional audience, but also so much money was put into expanding the technical side of it that it was cheaper to produce the the grayscale packaging so yeah. uh, let's know. face it i think we all know alan sugar alan sugar for those that are in other countries um presents who owns amstrad presents uh the british version of the apprentice which obviously we know hmm. the person who presented the american version of that we don't <laughs> want to talk about him um so he's very much all about the profit and uh, and whatnot. So yeah, I can totally see that. Mm. Um, yeah, and and I think looking at their later models, their home PCs, everything, they definitely decided that the the home gaming market was was not for them. I think they tried with their console. They had a console version, didn't they? They did. Yeah, the GX four thousand. 
which was uh, essentially how did that go? <laughs> well, they they said it was comparable to uh, some of the uh, later consoles moving into the 16-bit era, but essentially it was an 8-bit gaming machine. So um, it 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 was had more colors if i remember right the color palette was better and the sound chip was good but it wasn't a great machine so yeah but they did then partner with sega and release a, a pc that had uh, a slot for mega drive games oh, okay uh, pretty good so um yeah it has a legacy and i think um well alan sugar's recently bought back the amstrad name uh, which he's gifting to his son uh, it's now Amstrad Digital, if I remember rightly. So there is the potential we may I've see. Just, I just looked up. It was the Amstrad Mega PC. That's the one. Yeah, it was released one. in 1993 under license from Sega. Yeah, it was so similar maybe we'll see an Amstrad just... Mini at some stage. I think there's a market for it. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, like Gary was saying, uh, it's well, it is. It's not the licensee. It's who owns these games. Yeah. And I think from 40 years ago, or even 35 years ago, um, you've got, nowadays, you've got lawyers own games. You've got finance companies own games. Um, mm. And they own them because they've in, bought out a, a, bought the, the name of a... Yeah, uh, they bought a company's assets and then sold them all off and just gone, oh, this is a game from 1986. Nobody wants that. Mm. And unless it's a big, big game, you know that, you know, speaks to them. I think they just they just wipe them off. And like like you said, you have to pay for movie ones or sound. You have to pay royalties and all this kind of thing. And once they've done that, it it can only be from a, a an act of of, of love, love yeah. for the game rather than for profit. And unfortunately, a lot of the people that own these things are just out for the profit and it's not worth the effort um you know your retro yeah. fans are not unfortunately the people who own these things that's true, that's true. well we've got um harrier attack which is one of the original amstoff games was re-released on android um probably two three years ago i could be wrong on the date but okay and it and it's been upgraded it's uh durell software i believe uh, did the release, but um, it's fantastic and it's, it's oh, it's not one of these side scrolling things where you have to dodge uh missiles and yeah, there's tanks shooting at you and then you have to drop bombs and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. It, it's I'm really just... hard. The original was really hard. Um, obviously, you could learn the patterns of the game because it didn't really deviate too much, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was a fantastic game. I think it was about seven levels, uh, so it was quite easy to complete if you knew. If you could memorize the patterns of the game, um, yeah, you had Salt Saltaire's Maze, there's another one, and Thundercats, and there was loads of like BBC um, and, and ITV, or was it Channel Three um, TV licensing, like Super Ted and Trapdoor. And like <laughs> oh, that. I loved Super Ted and Spotted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah fantastic. Uh, so, so now I'm looking here. I'm, I'm looking at so I'm looking at Wikipedia as you know the the authoritative bit of information. Of it's got Amstrad under Amstrad Sinclair ZX Spectrum two plus two and plus three. So the tape and the disc yeah. version. So essentially, Amstrad bought out Spectrum. They what? Bought out Spectrum. Yep, they bought out the brand, and they replicated the Amstrad CPC four six four. It expanded some of the inners and released this. Yeah, mid range the plus two. with the so the plus uh, two for those that don't know was the tape deck one that built in tape deck yeah which yeah. the 464 did have a tape deck built in from day one didn't it it did yeah. um and then the plus three was a disc i don't think were they five and a quarter inch discs but it they were, um, they were ma when they magnetic discs or something I can't remember. Uh, it was a three inch. They were three inch discs, but they were similar to the five and a quarter inch discs. They were sort of very, they were literally floppy. You know, if you bent them, they bent. <laughs> they were they were not like your your, your three and a quarter inch uh, ones that you could bang on the desk kind of thing, and, and that you used yeah. in the the Commodore, Amiga, and Atari ST and PCs. Um, yeah, but it, wow. it had it. It had better specs than CPC, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was a it was a brand 
worth buying and and somehow these arch enemies came to some agreement and yeah well if they you owned know, it you would did whatever they were. i presume that uh close sinclair was probably not part of that sale um because i think he I think was moving on at the time he went on to yeah. oh, what what was the what was the bike thing uh the, the c5 wasn't it the c5 sinclair c5 yeah. maybe he was off to create that that success yeah. <laughs> uh, i think it was rest, uh, rest his soul yeah. I th- I th- he was a he was an amazing innovator but uh not the best businessman i don't think no. um well amtrak buried, <laughs> amtrak buried spectrum quite quickly after that that initial release i think there was a couple more machines and then they buried the brand um, quite quickly so oh, game wise it was still supported to my knowledge so um but there were limitations on the spectrum particularly the, the first two the massive limitations um the amstrad had more color the colors were more more available um but technically 64 kilobytes of ram the six yeah. uh, the 464 and then obviously the 6128 had 128 kilobytes of ram which obviously there was there was the spectrum 128k um which i think because things were developed for the uh for the 48k mostly i don't think things really took advantage of that no um but obviously with the they had 64 kilobytes it's, it, it is just weird to speak about it though because even 64 kilobytes i mean you're, that you're talking nowadays a, a document that's a document size extra yeah yeah and and yet th- this was the difference between having more colors or more sprites on the screen or uh you know different a different mode or something and yeah it was it's just amazing the, the technology behind the 8-bit era was absolutely amazing uh yeah it was and it still has legacy today i mean you look only have to look at some of the prices on on ebay and what these things are going for and, and i don't think there's anyone to my knowledge that has a complete amstrad or spectrum collection i think it's um it's one of those things that people collect for but there's no end to that collection because there were so many different games and, and independent bedroom developers and yeah it was just endless so you could never truly get a full no. No, I think official games. I think there are a lot. There are a lot available, um, but then again, they're on tapes, so they're always you know you they've got to be backed up. I think nowadays because tapes, even even if they've been stored very well and in a dry atmosphere, that there's chances they could have disintegrated, kind of thing. Um, but yeah. yeah, like you said, they, they'll they'll never. There were there was hundreds and hundreds of games. You go to a game shop. And there would be all sorts of, yeah, you know, walls, walls of games from this country, from other countries, you know, that that were ones you'd heard of. And then you had value games where they'd be, I think they used to be ninety nine p. Yeah, because games one, games were generally about five between five and eight pounds kind of thing. I think I remember games being. I remember spectrum. my mum paying nine ninety nine for RoboCop. And, oh, mate, um, much. And but then the. the but you had to, but then value games you could get there was various ranges yeah there wouldn't be 99p or or you'd like like the hit squad you'd you'd pay five pounds yeah, and you'd get 20 games yeah. on the tape but then you'd have to find the yeah. game on the tape <laughs> yeah I had that to... was the problem i mean you had the hit squad game where you had the one game and you could pay 199 for the singular game or like you say like 10 games in one pack for the, the ultimate um what's it the la collection cpc collection promotion software that had 15 games from top gun to batman to uh kung fu fighting and match point tennis and rambo so and they were fantastic but you'd have multiple cassettes in there that you'd have to figure out where the game was I had one of the best compilations I ever had was Spectrum, it wasn't Amstrad, uh, was actually the, um, it was the band, uh, the Live Aid, Band Aid, Live Aid, Band Aid, whatever oh, really? they called it, um, and they released a yeah. game yeah. compilation. Now, oh, wow. I, I can't remember the games, I remember there being um, oh, Live Aid game compilation, sorry, I'm just going to look this up quickly. 
and oh, did I see? I can't find it. Live Aid because it had a do they at the beginning of the of the tape there was do they know it's Christmas? Um, yeah, and then uh, and then there was yeah there was about ten games on it. I think it was on one one tape. So you just had to turn it over to find. Um, yeah, it was brilliant. I, I can't remember the games that were on it. They were all, I think, what you'd probably call indie games nowadays. Um, yeah. uh, game tape. Uh, let's have a look. The TT Spectrum. No, no, I just can't find it. I can't find it. There was definitely there was definitely a uh, one. I'll have to look that up. But uh, but yeah, there was. RC Pro Am, I think, was on it. Oh, maybe. Good game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think maybe that, or something very similar. Probably a, probably a knockoff. But yeah, the, the, the compilations were funny, and, and kids now will never, never know the the uh, frustration of starting a game, <laughs> trying to find a game. No, I don't want to play that one because you didn't know which game it was. No, when and you get started the context like, error. It, as you'd the be like, loaded. hang on, I think this is it. Because you'd have to fast forward, but you wouldn't know if you'd fast forwarded too far. So you'd yeah. just find the end of where there was a gap, start playing, um, and it would load up the game. And you'd be like, ah, oh, it's the wrong game. And then you'd have to go, right, it's two more games on. So you'd have to fast forward again, load up another game. And these games yeah. would take four or five minutes to load up they sometimes. Would. Yeah. <laughs> then the tape would be dusty and you'd get an error or something like that and you'd yeah. start all over again. Interestingly, I just found the variation of the, the Spanish variation I mentioned earlier. Oh, so yeah. it, was, it was called the CPC 472. It was essentially a 464. So in August of 1985, Spain briefly introduced an import tax of 15,000 pesetas, that was a 90, tax dodge. 90 euro, euros, on computers containing 64 kilobyte or less of RAM. The new law mandates that all computers sold also have to have a Spanish keyboard. So to circumvent this, uh, Amstrad Spanish distributor Instacomp, who came became Amstrad Spain, created and distributed the CPC 472 with a modified version of the 464. Its main difference was an additional daughter board containing the CPC 664 ROM chip with eight kilobyte of memory on it and a keyboard with an M <laughs> with a little apostrophe thing over the top. Um, it wasn't the sole purpose of the memory chip was nothing. It was not electrically connected in the machine at all. <laughs> but it had, memory. it had 72 kilobytes. Yeah. But it increased the memory um, on, on, on paper to 72 kilobytes yeah. to circumvent the import tax. Yeah. So uh, there we are. <laughs> that uh, is that is pretty ge ingenious, really, isn't it? It's just like, yeah, yeah, we just stuck it in there. Yeah, but how did you connect it? No, we didn't. We just stuck it in there, literally stuck it. And from what I understand, <laughs> these were leftover chips from something else. That At the end of the day, if you're selling something for two hundred pounds or the equivalent in um, what was it, uh, pesetas back then, it would have yeah. been. Um, then if you if if you're having to pay an extra thirty pounds in tax because it's fifteen percent, um, then it picks something up that costs you twenty pence or fifty P. Stick that in and you don't have to pay the extra thirty pounds. Yeah, why yeah. not? I think it's uh I'm just seeing what the uh, the value ratio now is uh, for inflation on the price of the Amstrad. So the Amstrad value now, so it costs two nine nine for the color version. That is the equivalent of nine hundred and seventy four pounds and fifty five pence in today's money. Wow, uh, that's essentially oh, yeah. a four K TV with a keyboard. <laughs> uh, oh, I just found uh, there's a you can buy a, an Amstrad version of Robocop Ocean Software from Spain for the equivalent of fifteen pounds fifty. The tape. Yeah. Well, I've still uh, got, I've still got my original one that I had when I was uh, six years old. Oh, I, I don't, and it still works. I, I don't know if we actually. Ooh, I wonder if my dad does actually have my Spectrum. I'd have nothing to connect it to, I think, because um, you know nowadays 
TVs. Um, and I only have a cheap TV. Uh, but yeah, I wonder if I'd, he does. I very much doubt he'd have any of the software. I don't think. Well, if you still got it, let me know because I have a TV in the loft that you could te test it out on. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. So. It, it, yeah. It would, would it be looked after? It would have been moved. But yeah, I'll have to ask him and find out if he yeah. does still have it. Um, yeah. We probably, I can imagine, sold it or something when uh, or it. when it became <laughs> obsolete. Well, not yeah. obsolete, but outdated. Um, and we got a computer. We had a PC from. Yeah, I think early nineties um, in the in our in our house. Um, the good old I days think. of Windows ninety eight. <laughs> well, I think we, yeah, it would have been ninety five. So yeah, so it would have been yeah. mid nineties because I remember we had. Did we have a three point one? We might have had a three point one PC, but I think the the first one I remember was ninety five, uh, yeah. which obviously would have been around ninety five. Um, and then yeah, we had yeah then we had. So, yeah, but that doesn't yeah. matter. That's for another day, right? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So we've yeah we haven't done our usual stuff because uh, we had the brilliant won't call him a legend because he doesn't like it, but uh, the legend uh, Gary Bracey and <laughs> and yeah, so forty years since Amstrad it makes me feel Make, very. Does old. it make you feel old? <laughs> it, does, it does. I turn forty five next month, so. Um... Oh, I'm afraid to tell you, I turn 46, so I'm afraid uh, we'll, we'll, we'll only be uh, the same age for a couple of weeks, because uh, no. I'm the end of the month, I'll be 46. <sighs> Immiserations. <laughs> yes, well, I'll be I'll be in London on my birthday, but doing something that was originally meant for my wife and kids. Yeah. Uh, so, but it should be fun. Maybe we, be need, fun. A, maybe we need a birthday uh, retro uh shopping trip. a retro shopping trip yeah. <laughs> i or won't be just, able to buy anything or even just a gaming trip so. yeah of course we'll have to do something because it's coming up to a, a holiday soon all right yeah. so guys new game yeah. new gaming uh focus on gaming name yeah yay exciting um i think everything's been changed so update any links uh or youtube channel is focus on gaming podcast i believe um uh the Facebook is Focus on Gaming Podcast and as such like. We do have as well Focus on Gaming Pod Focus on Gaming dot co dot UK. And uh, that is up and working now, I believe. Mm. The old links should work, but they should just forward onto the same website. So um, yeah. The like subscribe. Right. Yeah, and, like uh, and subscribe and all that. Join us next week for episode forty two. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>